Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's A Disciple's Point of View. So we are obviously still continuing in our series, What Does the Bible Say About? And last week we talked about aliens, aliens from the outer space variety. And I just have to thank everybody really fast for clicking continuously on that video. At last count, it was over 5,700 views. That blows me away. And I just want to thank you all for clicking and watching and commenting, even though some of the comments were rather interesting, I have to admit. But uh, at the same time, I just, I'm so grateful for the, the work that I put in that other people will watch it and hopefully get something out of it. And then hopefully the Lord will utilize it to touch your heart and to hopefully, if you don't know Jesus Christ, to bring you to that faith in Jesus Christ. And that's going to be a little bit of our discussion today. But anyway, just a quick thank you so much for watching last week. So bringing it up to speed this week, we're going to bring up a topic that is a little bit contentious, a little bit controversial, but it's this idea of predestination versus free will. This is going to be a topical discussion because this is a topic we could probably talk about for years and centuries. And theologians have been doing just that for the last 2,000 years and probably before that amongst the uh, the Jewish scholars and whatnot during the uh, days of the Old Testament. Um, and people still do it to this day. But basically, we also want to say this is not a topic that we should ever divide over as a church. Realistically speaking, this doesn't matter in the grand scheme of salvation. It really doesn't. We come to Christ. We know Christ. We are uh, maintained in Christ. We still pursue Christ. Doesn't matter if we were predetermined to do so or if we had free will to do so. This is more or less just an interesting kind of discussion. And I'm going to, my point at the very end might surprise you. So I would encourage you to watch this whole video or listen to the entire podcast. Kind of hear what I have to say about it and maybe give you some food for thought. But ultimately, do not divide over this issue. I honestly would not even argue about this issue. I would just simply thank God for the salvation you have, or if you don't know Christ, to definitely, I want you to, by the end of this video, hopefully see your need for Jesus Christ, and uh, by the end of this, would call him Savior and Lord. But anyway, let's jump into our discussion. We're going to cover the free will side of things first. This is also often called the Arminian position for a, a gentleman by the... I believe his name was Joseph Arminius. And the contention is, is that basically we are the ones that choose Christ. We are the ones who choose everything in life. God just simply, uh, he's standing back and he's hoping we make the right decision. And if we choose Christ, then we are the ones who are responsible for that. Okay. And some of the reasoning behind this is the first point that I want to talk about is moral determinism. Who has the responsibility here to choose good or to choose bad? I've seen one argument that basically said if we're predestined, if we have no control over what we do, good or bad, then ultimately God is responsible for our sins. And obviously that is a lie. We know that's not the truth. Uh, but if we don't have the ability to choose, if we don't have that possibility, some would argue that the responsibility doesn't fall on us. And clearly the Bible puts responsibility square on the person who sins, right? If you sin, you will die. The soul that sins shall die, according to Ezekiel 18, verse 20, right? Uh, the second point that I want to talk about within the free will argument is that this is implied in the Bible all throughout. But specifically, we have the, say, the fall of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. They chose to eat of the fruit even when they were told not to. That was something that they decided to do. They chose to do it, even though they were deceived that Eve was initially deceived into taking of the fruit. She was told what would happen if, if she took the fruit, even though she was deceived and lied to, she still made that choice. In Joshua 24, verses 15, or I'm sorry, 14 through 15, Joshua said uh, that he and his household will serve the Lord. He was basically calling out evil in that time. And he's like, you know, you do what you want, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They chose to do that very thing. 
And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. So basically, you have that choice or not. It's like no temptation has seized you. You can either choose to act on that sin or not when you're tempted. And then if you do or if you have that temptation, you have the choice for the way out or to go the way of sin, etc. So you have that choice. You have that ability to choose, okay? The third point is, is that true love. God doesn't want robots, right? And the idea is that if he predetermined us to uh, attain salvation and to be his people, we would be nothing more than robots, heartless robots who really don't love him as he wishes to be loved. But we choose him because he provided a way of salvation. We see it. We know our need for it. And so then we choose that. Not only that, but there is a greatest commandment that Jesus talked about in Matthew 22, verses 30, 37 through 39, Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 31, and Luke chapter 10, verse 27. That basically, we should love the Lord our God with all our whole um, uh, mind, soul, and spirit. And the second is just like it, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. This is basically implying that there is a choice there. We have the ability to love God with all that we are or not, and we're the ones who do that and have the agency for that. So that's the free will side of things. Uh, predestination is this idea that God predetermines who will be saved. So the idea here is, is that the first point is that God tends to do the choosing, not us. And there are some examples of that. God did the creating of us in the very first place. He was the one who formed us and made us and whatnot in Genesis 1, verses 26 through 27 specifically. If we fast forward later in the account of Genesis, Abram, who was later renamed Abraham, was the one who was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. That was specifically where he was living at the time. That's in Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. The prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament days was actually said that he, or God actually told him he was chosen from the womb to be a prophet. And that is Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Jesus, fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus told the apostles he chose them. They did not choose him. And that is in John 15, verse 16. The Apostle Paul tells us specifically that we were predestined in love. And that is in Ephesians 1, verses 13 through 14, and also in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. The second point is, is that dead people can't choose life. Okay, And this is found in Ephesians 2, verse 1, and Colossians 2, verse 13, um, that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. The thing of it is, is that if we are dead, if a dead body is lying on the ground, can it raise itself? Can it do anything of its own? Can it decide to be removed up off the floor? It has to be acted upon by an outside force. And that's the same thought and idea here, is that if we are dead in our trespasses and sin, we cannot choose to live. We cannot choose the way of salvation. We will just simply stay in our sinful state until acted upon by an outside force, i.e. the Holy Spirit's conviction within us and then the Holy Spirit enabling us to believe the truth of God. Okay, so we have those two sides here. We have free will versus predestination. And this is and those are basically the basic talking points of this topical discussion that I wanted to bring up. Human beings have a flaw within them. They always want to choose one thing or the other. It's kind of like, is it nature or nurture? Well, can it be both? And I kind of want to make that same postulation here. Can it be predestination and free will at the same time? I know that there are some who bring that up and they're like, nope, it's got to be one or the other. Okay, I'm going to, again, I don't want to say that we should divide over this. We should not be dogmatic. I hope that this is just an interesting discussion and food for thought for you. So the Bible clearly states that God is three in one. Okay, there it's all throughout the Bible. That is clearly a podcast for another day to really articulate that in its fullness. But if God is truly three in one, which he is, that is a paradox. That doesn't even seem like that's possible. That can't go together, much like predestination and free will, right? 
second paradox I want to talk to you about is Jesus became a man, yet was still fully God. And that is found in Philippians 2, verses 6 and 7. That is a paradox. So how can Jesus be a, a man, you know, just a man only, but also God? It's a paradox, right? It doesn't make sense, just like predestination and free will. Jesus, also being the God-man, entered into the limitation of space and time, but did not lose his traits as being eternal as well. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. See also John chapter 1. That is also a paradox, much like predestination and free will. So this idea is, is that basically, I, the point I'm trying to make, we choose to sin. And that is what our flesh tends to default to with its lusts and desires. The world wants us to do that same thing because they're doing it just as much as our flesh and our desires wants us to sin. So they don't want you to go any different because if you go different, it convicts them about what they're doing is wrong and they don't want to feel that way. And the enemy or Satan clearly wants you to sin because that's his only way to hurt God. I believe that basically Satan is very embittered with God because he did not have any chance at mercy whatsoever when he sinned. He was immediately judged and he had no chance at mercy. That See also Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, whereas we received mercy. And I believe that the enemy of our souls, Satan, uses us to war with God. That is the only way he is able to fight against the omnipotent and eternal God, okay? So those three forces are always wanting to drag us down and to cause us to sin. But what if the moment we choose to sin, we're dead? We're just simply dead. So we're the ones who end up choosing to sin. That's easy to see. If you have little children, you know exactly what this looks like. You tell them that they can't have something, what is it that they instantly try to do <laughs> for seeming eternity? They try to do that very thing you told them not to do. And then if you tell them they can't do it, they lash back at you and they're like, no. They want to do it all the more, right? But what if whenever we choose to do that or the first time consciously, knowingly, and this is where I'm talking about the Christian idea of the age of accountability. We choose that, and in that moment before God, we die spiritually. Ezekiel 18, verse 20, the soul that sins shall die. We then cannot choose life until God chooses to act upon us and opens our eyes to the truth. It's kind of like if you were driving a car for whatever reason blindfolded, and you're like, I'm driving just fine. No, I have no problem with this. I can hear the road just fine. And then no worries, no worries whatsoever. I know it's kind of a ridiculous analogy, but stick with me here. And what if an outside force acts upon you and takes that blindfold off and all of a sudden you see you're racing towards a very steep cliff? Any person of sound mind will slam on the brakes to keep from going over, right? Because the bulk of us have a very strong survival instinct. We don't want to die. So then we stop short and we don't fall off the cliff because we were acted upon by an outside force to make us see that we were about to fall off the cliff and die. That is my postulation of how predestination and free will kind of works together. Because it's like we, we do choose to sin. I mean, we do the wrong things all the time as human beings. All the time. And if you say you don't, you're not being honest with yourself. Because all of us do. OK, all of us fall short of the glory of God. That's not saying that's an excuse, but it's a truth about the human condition. OK, and then God then comes alongside of us and then opens our eyes to the truth in love. He predestined us. God created us with this possibility of sin. We did sin. And some have said that, you know, well, God knows who would choose him. And so, you know, that that's that's how he predetermined. It was more like foresight. Uh, I don't know if this is necessarily really a biblical model. I would say probably the more biblical model would be he created us with the potentiality of sin. We did sin. And so God predetermines then who he will save and who he won't save. He has that judicial right 
as the righteous judge. And we could sit here and argue the merits of that or not, and that could go on ad infinitum. That could go on for a really long time. But I just kind of wanted to drop a topical study here, give you a thought and idea that, you know, it may not necessarily be one way or another, but two things working in concert together that are seemingly paradoxical. But guess what, folks? We serve a paradoxical God. We serve a God who does things that are impossible, but he makes it possible all the time. If we were dead in our trespasses and sins, if I was dead in my trespasses and sins, I am now talking to you about the virtues and wonderfulness that is found in Jesus Christ and the salvation that can be had in him. And if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. If that's not impossible, I don't know what is. I still remember when I told people I was a Christian way back in the day. And they were like, you were the last person we ever expected to become a Christian. God can take anybody. I was having a discussion with a friend about witchcraft. And he said I shouldn't do it because he shouldn't even be doing it. And then he told me about the gospel. Out of the blue. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. In that moment, I knew I needed Christ. Whatever he was talking about, I needed that. That is the answer my soul had been looking for. And I know it's anecdotal. But it's true nonetheless. It's true nonetheless. So if you're listening to this and you're not a Christian, and you want to find out how one appropriates this thing called eternal life and how you can be free from the burden of guilt that your sin carries upon you and how you know that you can be made right before God, I want you to listen to the next segment coming up in just a few seconds. At this point in the podcast, I want to reach out to you. And if you have never done so, if you have never entered into a saving relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that today. All you need to do is believe. Believe that Jesus is who he said he was. He was God in the flesh. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Confess him as Lord. And the Bible says that you will be saved if you do that. If you truly believe in your heart that he is who he said he was and that he did exactly what he said he would do for you, you will be saved. It is simply that easy. A lot of people say prayer, prayer. And that's great to confess and put your mind and heart and everything through a process, if you will, to embody what has already taken place in your heart. By simply praying, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And now I confess you as Lord. Please take control of my life, and I want to follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's all you need to do, and your life will change. Your life will change not so much materially, not so much in terms of the world, but your life will change in your standing before God in that you may know that you can have eternal life. The Apostle John wrote that when he was pinning 1 John. He said, I write these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you can hope, not that you can wonder, but so that you can know. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. <laughs>